is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Uh, presenting for us are Sarah Poon and Jen Humberstone. I'm going to hand the mic over to them in just a second so they can introduce themselves. Uh, in the meantime, I'm Nick Weiner from Open Channels, and thank you all for joining us today. Uh, just to give you all a few uh, notes about using the GoToWebinar interface, there's a little red-orange arrow in the top right corner of your screen that'll share or hide the GoToWebinar interface. Uh, and in there is a little questions panel. Uh, if you have any questions at any time during the webinar, just go ahead and type them in there, and that'll come in to me, and then I'll relay those to Sarah and Jen at the end of the webinar. Uh, so at any time, if you have any questions, just go ahead and pop them in there. And with that, I will hand it over to you both. Thank you all for presenting today. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Nick. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, you're coming through just fine. Uh, great. Hi, everybody. I'm Sarah Poon from Environmental Defense Fund. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you're joining us from. And thanks so much for joining our webinar to learn about our community-based tool for designing turf reserves in data-limited small-scale fisheries. As I said, I'm Sarah Poon from Environmental Defense Fund, and I work in our Fisheries Solutions Center, which is a team focused on design and development of sustainable fishery management tools and resources. And my role in the Solutions Center is to provide training and tools for supporting implementation of effective fishery management programs, including an approach that we call turf reserves. I've had the opportunity to deliver trainings on turf reserve design and management to partners around the world, including people from the Philippines, Belize, Brazil, Indonesia, Spain, Mexico, and Cuba. And the folks we've worked with in these regions are consistently interested in technical tools to help them make management decisions. In particular, we and our partners at Fish Forever, from RARE and the Sustainable Fisheries Group at UC Santa Barbara, we're motivated to create easy-to-use tools to help communities implement turf reserves. And we're fortunate to have students like Jen who have been able to help us out with this. Hi, everybody. I'm Jen Macy Humberstone. I'm in the middle there in that photo. Um, I am now a Sustainable Seafood Coordinator at SCS Global Services. But um, importantly for this webinar, I'm a recent graduate from the Bren School of Environmental Science and Management at UC Santa Barbara. I'm one of five master's students from the Bren School who developed the Turf Reserve Design Tool for EDF and the Fish Forever Partnership as part of our master's thesis project, and our whole group is pictured here. It was a highly collaborative process, and we received excellent guidance and support from members of the Fish Forever team in the Philippines and the U.S. throughout the development of the tool. So, Happy to be here and um, help Sarah present to you today. Thanks, Jen. And we're really looking forward to sharing this tool with all of you. Uh, many of you are coming from different backgrounds and different places around the world. And we appreciate your thoughts about potential applications and your feedback on how we can improve the tool that we've developed. Many, if not all of you, are aware of the importance of healthy oceans and sustainable fisheries management, especially in the developing world. About 3 billion people around the world rely on fish as a primary source of protein. And small-scale fisheries employ nearly 90% of the world's 37 million capture fishers. And they support another 84 million people who are employed in jobs associated with fish processing, distribution, and marketing. That's why at EDF, we're driving sustainable fishery management transformation through a combination of unique partnerships, smart policy and sound science. Our goal is to see more fish in the water, more food on people's plates, and more profitable fishing communities around the world. As part of this effort, we've teamed up with RARE and the Sustainable Fisheries Group at UC Santa Barbara in a global initiative called Fish Forever. Some of you may have heard of this or may be part of this partnership, which is great. And through this, we're helping to restore nearshore fisheries to health by working with fishing communities to manage their resources responsibly. Fish Forever aims to empower fishers and other stakeholders to do this through the creation of turf reserves. A turf reserve is a fishery management approach that combines two types of spatial management. A turf, or a territorial use right for fishing, is a defined area that's allocated for the exclusive use by a designated group of fishers. Because the group has a sense of ownership over the fishery in this designed area, they have a good incentive to be responsible stewards. In a turf reserve, a note 
reserve is located within or adjacent to the turf. Fishing is prohibited within the, the reserve, and that allows the area to act as a sanctuary for fish and protect habitats and biodiversity. So when you combine these two approaches, the turf and the reserve, you get some really important synergies that promote sustainable fisheries. The reserve acts to replenish the fished area as fish swim from the productive reserve into the turf. This is known as spillover. And the fishers in the turf are motivated to ensure compliance with the reserve since they're the ones who will directly benefit from the productivity of the reserve and from the spillover. We've seen this management approach applied in dozens of nearshore fisheries around the world, and we're working to take it to scale to help address the global overfishing problem. A key part of our work is to train local leaders to engage fishers and other stakeholders in a community-based turf reserve design project process. Designing a turf reserve involves a lot of decisions like where the boundaries of the turf and the reserve will be located, who will be allowed to fish in the turf, and what rules they'll follow to ensure that harvest is sustainable. In our Fish Forever sites, campaign managers are trained to help stakeholders make all these key decisions. They help the community articulate their goals, which will guide the rest of the design process. They work to collect local knowledge and biophysical data about the fishery. And they set up community working groups to design and manage the turf reserves accordingly. But we've noticed a common challenge for stakeholders across different contexts. During the planning process, there's lacked a quantitative way to support their decision making. In particular, they want to be able to ensure that the boundaries of the turf and reserve that they design will be able to support their goals, and also that the design appropriately reflects the local ecology and the social context. So when they're faced with multiple options for turf and reserve boundaries, how do they know which are more, most likely to support the recovery of the fish stocks that they rely on? Many of us are familiar with some really great marine spatial planning tools that are already being used to address questions like these in a variety of contexts. But sometimes these tools aren't practical for sites that have limited data or low technological capabilities or no internet access. So we set out to create a simple tool that could help stakeholders evaluate the trade-offs between different turf and reserve boundary options that they've identified in their planning processes. The Bren Master students designed the tool in Excel with a user-friendly interface to be accessible to a broad group of users. Really, anyone with basic Excel skills can download it to their desktop and read the step-by-step -step instructions provided in a user guide. The guide tells the user what data is needed and how to enter it into the tool. And once the user inputs basic data and the community's turf reserve design options, the tool runs a bioeconomic model to project the biological and economic outcomes across the different designs and across the target species that they care about. The outputs of the model are displayed on a visually appealing dashboard that can be used to communicate the results to stakeholders. The Turf Reserve Design Tool, here's a snapshot of it, it's called Turf Tools. It has a series of interactive tabs in a single Microsoft Excel file. And users go step by step through each tab to input data and design options, and then to view the results. So I'd like to provide an overview of how the tool works, and then I'm going to hand it over to Jen to talk about the opportunity she had to test and refine the tool with our Fish Forever partners in the Philippines. The first tab is the Habitats tab, where users can identify the habitats that are present within the management area. This data can be collected from mapping activities with stakeholders, or if available from underwater surveys or other types of data collection. The user is instructed to overlay a 10 by 10 grid onto the map, and the grid can be adjusted to represent any size map from a few hectares to a few square kilometers. And then the user indicates the dimensions of the grid and can input a habitat designation for each cell in the Excel model, as you can see here. Some common habitats are included in the model, but the user can modify them if needed for a different ecological context. In this example, you can see that there's an island in the middle, shown by the gray cells. And there are cells representing coral reefs, mangroves, and seagrasses. 
And there are also designations for where those habitats are degraded. There are also indications for areas that are used primarily for mariculture, shown in the light blue. One of the clear limitations of this tool, as you can see, is the coarseness of a 10 by 10 grid. But the advantage of this feature is that it makes the tool really easy to use, and it's simple for someone to enter data from a hand-drawn map. The second tab allows the user to input uses and other areas of interest on the grid. You can see an island here in white, and the majority of the space around it has been designated as fishing grounds, as indicated by the green cells. The yellow cell here indicates nursery grounds, and the red cells show important spawning habitats. The tool uses these designations to answer questions such as how much of the fishing grounds have been put in a reserve, or how well does the reserve protect key spawning and nursery grounds. And these designations can be easily customized in the tool, but one of the limitations of the current model is that the user can only input one designation per cell. So this might be a feature that we improve in future versions of the tool. The next tab is the Species tab, where users can input information about the species they intend to manage in the turf reserve. And here they can specify up to five target species that will be included in the model outputs. We recommend that they choose to model species that are important for the community with consideration for the types of species that can be managed well in a spatial management approach like a turf reserve. And the user can select the species from a drop-down menu, which you can see here at the top, or they can input the information manually. If they select it from the drop-down menu, the species data will fill in automatically from a life history database that's built into the tool. But of course, this automated data should be checked and modified as needed. So the basic data that's needed to run the model is housed in this tab, including the home range of the species, the growth rate, and a general assessment of the stock status. The user also indicates how the species relies on the different habitats at the site. And so that's what relates the species-specific data in this tab to the habitat designations that I showed you on the first tab. And finally, the user, the user enters an estimate of the level of illegal fishing, the average price and cost data for the species, the gear used, and an estimate of how much fishing pressure is currently applied. And all the instructions for inputting these data are included in the user guide. The next tab houses the spatial turf reserve design options. And it's important to point out here that we're relying on the community to come up with practical design options that are put into the tool in order to compare the different options. We know that there are many factors that determine what makes a practical and appropriate design that really can't be adequately housed in a simple tool like this. And so the tool doesn't attempt to generate an optimal design, but rather to compare user-generated designs. So the user first fills in a grid with the current management scenario, or the status quo. And then they can put up to five design options that have been proposed. And each design input is saved by pressing a button, and that runs the model through a macro function and then saves the outputs for later visualization and comparison, which I'll show you in a moment. So here you can see a hypothetical turf reserve design around the same island that we saw earlier. The islands represented by the white cells, the green cells indicate turf areas, and the yellow area indicates a no-take reserve. The blue cells are unmanaged open access areas around the turf reserve. For each design option that's entered and saved, the tool runs a bioeconomic model that simulates the fishery over a 20-year time horizon. The model projects total harvest, fish abundance in the water, and profits for each of the five species in each of the five design options. Because we know that there's a high degree of uncertainty, the outputs of the model is shown, are shown as relative outputs rather than absolute numbers. The outputs for each option are computed relative to the outcomes under the status quo scenario. So the user can compare the predicted outcomes of the different designs without giving potentially false indications of the magnitude of those outcomes. Instead, what they can focus on are the implicit ecological and economic trade-offs of the different design options across the different species that they've input into the model. 
And finally, the model displays the outputs on a dashboard that has a variety of customizable graphic representations of the data. And this allows the user to, so, to select what visualizations he or she thinks will be most useful for communicating, communicating the results out to the community. And um, they can choose whichever ones they think will resonate most with those stakeholders. So now I'd like to turn it over to Jen to tell you more about her experience developing the tool. Thanks, Sarah. So since the turf reserve design processes were already underway in the Philippines through the Fish Forever program, we chose to focus the initial design on the tool, of the tool on the Philippines context, with the goal of making it customizable for diverse applications across Fish Forever and beyond. Throughout the year-and-a-half-long group project cycle, my fellow students and I had the opportunity to travel to the Philippines multiple times to visit some of the sites where projects are underway, to better understand local data availability and context, and later to test the tool with some of our partners in the field. As we were developing the tool, the Rare Philippines team was working with local partners in the first four Fish River sites um, that will be shown on the next slide by the red dots. Um, two of our team members had the opportunity to spend the summer in the Philippines with Rare staff and partners. They worked with the Rare Philippines team to better understand the types of information being collected and education taking place as community leaders and Rare Field staff prepared communities for the turf reserve design process. In March, our team returned to the Philippines with a prototype tool in hand. We met with the Rare staff and local partners from each of the four sites to demonstrate our initial version of the tool and get their feedback on its usefulness and suggestions for improvement. We also had the opportunity to explain the tool to 12 partners um, from 12 additional sites that were just launching Fish Forever projects. And finally, we were able to visit some fishing communities in the Philippines where we conducted one-on-one -on -one interviews to get a better understanding of the context in which our tool would be applied. For this presentation, I will discuss our tool in the context of one of the prototype sites that we used to build the tool and bet its effectiveness with local partners. This site is Ayoki Island, and it's located in the municipality of Cantilan in Surigao del Sur in the Philippines. Ayoki Islands has been a participant, or Ayoki Islands has been a participant in Fish River since 2013 and has already undergone preliminary steps to prepare a turf reserve design. We learned about the process that the fishers of Ayoki were going through to collect data and plan for turf reserve implementation, which was being led by Cherry Ravello Salazar, a community leader who was trained through Rare's Signature Pride program. The com community had completed the Participatory Coastal Resource Assessment, or what we'll call PCRA, which is a community survey that compiles the majority of the local ecological knowledge needed to parameterize the model. The PCRA data collection includes community mapping of habitats and zoning, identification of high volume and high value species, commonly used fishing gears, results of underwater surveys, among other social, economic, and biological information. We knew that the PCR was being done in all the Fish River Philippine sites, so we were able to design the tool knowing that we would have this information available. Since the community had not yet proposed design options, we tested the tool using a set of hypothetical designs based on Aoki Island context and data from their PCRA. So although this demonstration features hypothetical designs, it demonstrates the applicability of the tool in the Fish River Philippines context and allowed us to demonstrate how the tool can reflect economic and ecological trade-offs inherent in different design options. So, in Ayoki Island, there is an existing marine reserve, which we can all see here on the screen in yellow. And most designs that we built centered on this pre-existing piece of the turf reserve strategy. So, design two depicts a turf of equal size to design one, but it's in a different area of the island, and that's in the top right. This design was chosen to demonstrate the importance of site placement for biological traits of target species, as well as the benefit of adjacent turf and reserves. Design 4 features a larger turf surrounding the current reserve, and Design 3 has a larger marine reserve. And all of these designs were chosen to reflect trade-offs between ecological and economic performance. So here we have one of the charts from the dashboard that Sarah showed you before. So as I've said, we've, we've put these designs in, and we've used the habitat data for Mayuki Island, and we've put in species information for high-valued spiny lobster and leopard coral grouper, 
which were identified also in the PCRA. So there are implicit trade-offs in design options, as we can see here. And one of our key decisions as a team was to provide relative trade-off analysis rather than an optimized design. Um, as Sarah was mentioning, we see this as really critical because we believe it is up to the community to establish goals and priorities and to design really feasible options. And then they can collaborate, collaboratively evaluate the trade-offs. So the four turf reserve designs tested for Aoki, design four, which is in blue here, with the largest turf among all designs performs best in terms of both fish abundance and harvest. However, when we're looking at trade-offs, we must also consider the increased challenges of enforcing a larger turf, especially regarding resources for monitoring and enforcement, or a spatial overlap with socially contentious areas. These are social factors. They're not incorporated in the model itself, but they're critical to the development of design options and community discussion in making design decisions. Design three, is seen here in yellow, features a larger reserve and resulted in higher fish abundance than design one, but lower fish harvest. This outcome is intuitive as there are more area for fish stocks to recover and less area for harvesting. The visualization, however, this trade-off is helpful in supporting a well-informed community discussion and decision-making framework. And design two here in green performs poorly both in terms of fish harvest and abundance probably because the turf location encloses less productive habitats and is located further from the reserve, if you remember from the previous slide. The design was targeted to demonstrate the importance of design best practices, such as turf location and understanding target species characteristics. A turf may be most socially convenient in one area, but this may come at a trade-off in terms of ecological and economic performance, and this design was put here to demonstrate that. That said, it is important to reiterate here that all these results are compared to the status quo scenario, and any positive values among both axes, in this case total fish abundance and total fish harvest, represent improvement upon the status quo scenario. Therefore, all four designs demonstrate an expected improvement to current management. So we've included here one other of the charts from the dashboard. Um, to, to show you that these visualizations that we've included in turf tools range in complexity and design depth. So the first chart that I showed you, 1B, displayed two performance indicators along axis and an optional third, which in this case was the bubble size representing turf area. This chart, 1C, displays all three key outputs, abundance, price, and harvest, with one geographic out output, such as turf or reserve area as well. If designs are very similar, this chart may be less interesting, but it offers a simple means to identify particularly strong and weak results, once again, all compared to the status quo. So now I've shown you a few examples of how outputs can be displayed, and all of these outputs are shown in the tool's output dashboard seen here. As communities like Ayoki work through work to evaluate different turf and reserve boundary options, users can select which of the charts, species, and outputs from the dashboard they think are most useful for conveying helpful information to stakeholders. The tool does not attempt to indicate which design is best, but rather allows users to interpret results as they relate to community's goals. Furthermore, this simple tool cannot model all the dynamics of a complex fishery. So users are encouraged to use the tool to complement a broader stakeholder-driven decision-making process in the context of other information that is relevant to design decisions. Thank you, Jen, for describing your experience in the Philippines and developing the tool. As Jen described, one of the benefits of this tool is that it was designed to be integrated into existing stakeholder planning and data collection processes in our Fish Forever sites. And it makes use of simple data that can be provided by fishery stakeholders themselves. And that's one of the greatest benefits of this tool. And it's also OK that there might be some uncertainty in these parameters because the tool compares the designs relative to one another. And we did some sensitivity analyses with the model to ensure that uncertainty in the parameters didn't affect the relative ranking of the designs. Another advantage of the tool, of course, is that it's really easy to use for anyone who has basic skills with Microsoft Excel. And it doesn't require complex modeling software or even internet access. Of course, a simple tool has limitations, and we're well aware of those. Uh, a key drawback that I noted earlier is that we're constrained to the 10 by 10 grid, 
meaning that the model is quite coarse, especially when it's applied across a large geographic area. Also, users can only select one type of habitat, one area of interest, and one management designation in each cell. Another drawback of the model's simplicity is that it's really only intended to be used for planning a single turf reserve. And understanding the dynamics between turf reserves in a, in a network might require a more advanced tool or modifications to this tool. Finally, it's important to remind you that any model relies on assumptions. And we assume, for example, that fishing within the turf is sustainable and that fish populations grow according to simple fishery population dynamics. Of course, in reality, um, things are much more complex than that, which is why it's really important, as Jen mentioned, for stakeholders to recognize the limitations of the tool and to use its results alongside other information to help them make design decisions. So this is just the first version of the Turf Reserve Design Tool, and we hope to continue to improve it to address some of these limitations that I mentioned, and also to meet the needs of fishery stakeholders in different contexts. We're working to apply it to turf reserve design processes for additional sites in the Philippines, as well as other Fish Forever countries. And we also hope that we can customize it and test it and improve it uh, in other places. So we'd be really happy to hear your input on fisheries where it might be applied, including what kinds of modifications you think would be needed to make it appropriate for that context. So if you'd like to take a closer look at the tool, you can actually download it by going to our Fishery Solutions Center website, which is fisherysolutionscenter.edf.org. And under the Resources tab, you can see that you can click on Turf Reserve Design Tool. And there's a description there and a button where you can click to download a zip file with the tool and the user guide. And I'd like to finish by thanking all the many people who've contributed to this project, especially Jen and her fellow students at the Bren School of Environmental Science and Management, and our Fish Forever partners at RARE and UC Santa Barbara. Thanks so much for joining us. And I think we have lots of time for questions. And again, here are some links for you to be able to access the tool. Thanks so much. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for presenting this. Uh, just to reiterate, if, you, if anybody has any questions, uh, there's the questions panel there in the GoToWebinar interface. Uh, you can expand that back out if you click the little orange red arrow in the top right hand corner of your screen, and then just type a question in there and that'll come back into us. Uh, we have a few here now. Uh, so Sarah, would you mind backing up about five slides for me to where you had a comparison of the different charts? Uh, let's see, one more, that one, there we go. Uh, so. Uh, can you explain the size of the uh, circles again on chart 1B? Sure. That sure, um, so panel yeah. can... Oh, go ahead, Jen. You, you can explain. Um, yeah. So in this case for chart 1B, the size of the bubble represents the size of the turf area. Um, but this is an example of something that can be customized in the output chart. So it could also represent the size of the reserve, or it could, um, the, the tab of areas of interest that Sarah showed you that had spawning areas and nursery areas, those can also be, um, they're kind of geographic outputs, or we call them non-model outputs. Um, they have to do with the actual physical design, and so those can also be visualized by the size of the bubble. So if you cared how much um, spawning areas were being covered in the reserve, you could show that with the bubble size. Excellent. Um, see, so another question here on um, how do you incorporate uh, social design decisions, uh, since it seems that this tool mostly focuses on biological and economic data? I can take a, a first stab at answering that question, and Jen can add anything if she'd like to. So we recognize that this tool has limited ability to reflect the complex social dynamics at a site. And so we actually hope that stakeholders will be able to consider those social factors as they're creating designs that they consider to be appropriate for their site. And um, so they can consider those kind of externally to uh, this tool, and the tool could be used to complement the information that they have about social factors. 
Um, of course, the you know the economic and biological outputs of the model may relate to the ability achieve certain social goals, so all of these factors should be considered hand-in-hand -in, -hand in a thoughtful, stakeholder-driven, participatory process. Yeah, and I'll just add to that that, yeah, I mean, Sarah's spot on this tool can't incorporate all the social factors, and it's not designed to. Um, our attempt to include the opportunity for um, in incorporating some of these social factors is that areas of interest tab. So as Sarah was saying, those could be customized. So you could put, um, you could mark where there's an important cultural resource or where there's area of contention and then you could see how much of your, um, you know, marine reserve incorporates fishing grounds. Um, and so you can kind of use those areas of interest to overlap with your turf reserve design and then see where um, where you might come across either you know positive results, marine area uh, reserve that includes spawning grounds, or potentially negative results, um, so fishing grounds that are inside of a of a marine reserve. Excellent, thank you. Uh, so kind of a, a follow up to that uh, with the legal framework side of things. Uh, if you don't have good local government legal support in this kind of case. Uh, how do you think that a turf would work out? Like, do you need more uh, law protection of putting in the turf reserve, or do these things seem to work really well with just like local social groups uh, buying into it? I think it's uh, safe to say that a turf is more likely to be effective if it has the appropriate legal backing to ensure that the Users have strong rights to use that area. Um, and so we'd recommend that policy processes be part of the stakeholder or the uh, turf reserve planning process. And I, another thing that might be a valuable note is that this tool could be used in a variety of ways. Um, so it, it could be used to potentially demonstrate some of the outcomes of a turf reserve, though of course that has to be done um, carefully because this model doesn't attempt to say, you know, a specific amount of um, profit increases that could be achieved from a turf reserve. But it could be helpful for demonstrating to policymakers um, that these systems do have um, you know, biological and economic outcomes that could be worth, um, you know, making policy decisions to support. Excellent. Let's see, and I just had, uh, oops, I think, trying to, there we go. Rodrigo, can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. Uh, Rodrigo wanted to jump in as well since he was on the UCSB team that developed the tool uh, part of answering this question. So please go ahead. Thank you. Hey, it, somehow the, the sound didn't work in the last two minutes, so maybe you already mentioned this. But I, I just wanted to add that in Chile we have a, a lot of turfs, and, and what we see when the governance or the government support is weak, we see a lot of illegal fishing. And uh, given that, in this tool we included um, a, a variable that you can change to, to consider how much illegal fishing is, is uh, expected in the case they put the turf and in case they put a reserve. So that's an indirect way to consider and to account for the differences in the in the governance of this community and in the government support for enforcement. Awesome, thank you. Uh, da, 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 da. Let's see, so there's uh, another question here more about this governance idea. Um, have you gotten feedback from local government authorities when you've been putting in the tools and like if they like this approach and they like the tool, that kind of thing? In Jen and the team's uh, experience in the Philippines, they worked with some of the campaign managers from the Fish Forever prototype sites. And some of those campaign managers are actual local government employees. And so 
in these cases, the the local government is very much involved in the design of um, and implementation of the turf reserve. And my understanding is that they've gotten very good feedback about how helpful this tool can be for helping visualize the potential outcomes of different turf and reserve designs. Um, but I, I think our use of the tool has been limited to that context. and we definitely like to get additional feedback from government stakeholders as we continue to test and refine the tool. Yeah, and we had, um, yeah, and there was beyond the community-based um, site managers that were off, often involved in the government, um, we had some representatives of um, government research institutions that are doing um, broader underwater surveys and some marine spatial planning work, and they're very interested in synergies and. I mean, I think overall this tool, thus far, is housed in this Fish River program that has done a lot to work with um, the government to um, build the program from the start, you know, within the context of, of local regulations. And actually what we heard on the ground as feedback when we were out in the Philippines in March was that um, these programs and implementing TERFs and, and by engaging the communities from the ground up. Um, the Philippines in particular does have a lot of uh, marine resource management laws on the books, but um, it kind of empowered local people um, in, at the community level to, you know, start enforcing and, and looking at those regulations. And so in that way, um, I think from, you know, the government was supportive and, and, and collaborative in, in the whole Fish Forever process there, not just um, in terms of this tool itself, which in reality is a small piece of, of the puzzle for what Fish Forever is trying to do there. So kind of piggybacking off of this, uh, how receptive have local fishers been uh, to this toolkit and the approach? Um, so I'll let Sarah speak more broadly. At the, where we were, um, we were working with the rare field staff and then these um, campaign managers. So we weren't um, trying to go directly to, um, you know, fishers and putting a computer in front of them and saying, all right, go ahead and, and use this tool. The idea is more that there's this whole process that's undergoing with, you know, the participatory coastal resource assessment that um, the PCRA that I was mentioning before and um, the pride campaigns that RARE's doing. And so in the case of Ayoki Island, it was Cherry. And so she's working with the community and liaising with them to kind of bring them along in the process um, to understand, um, you know, what the potential benefits of turfs and, and reserves would be. And so this is all going alongside. And so the tool is designed really to interface most um, with someone like Cherry and the rare field staff to incorporate the local data, incorporate designs that have been discussed in the community, and then take the results to prompt um, and facilitate a broader community discussion um, regarding the trade-offs between the designs that they were considering. But it's not, um, you know, exactly intended, at least in this, in the case of the Philippines, for um, you know, 20 fishermen to sit down and, and punch in different designs. Um, it might be different in different contexts, but that's the way that we saw it in the Philippines. Awesome, thank and you. I'll just add that thus far uh, for these four prototype sites, the we've our approach for testing the tool has been to. Um, be able to evaluate how it applies to the context. And thus far, we've had very minimal engagement um, in within the actual stakeholder um, design groups. And that will be another thing that we'll have to continue testing, is how well people uh, can understand the different outputs that are generated by the model and which are most useful for informing people's decisions and also what else they would like to see in the tool to help them make decisions. And that's one of the great things about this tool is that the students designed it to be customizable and adaptable so that we can continue to um, help make it as user-friendly as possible. Excellent. Uh, so, Jen, this probably goes more to you. Um, from your experience using this out in the field, uh, is there anything that you see that you would like to improve the most for the tool? <laughs> 
Um, you know, so I think what it what it really comes back to is is there are a lot of really um, incredible, sophisticated marine spatial planning tools out there that um, you know allow you know such so like Sea Sketch comes to mind. Ones where people can um, you can use really um, complex geospatial data and have people drawing on maps, but um, when you know, Sarah came to us with this idea for a project. It was, you know, based on the idea of, of what um, she was describing earlier, that in this context, there isn't necessarily a ton of data available, and there isn't necessarily internet um, resources to buy expensive software um, and expertise in such software. So, you know, we limited ourselves to the Excel platform because we figured that that's the baseline, right? And from there, you know, you could, you know, move up into more complex things, but, you know, we saw Excel as the most transferable platform, um, and it's easily customizable, it's not a black box, and so I think that the, you know, the, a lot of what it came down to is limitations that we faced were those of that platform in the end, um, and so there were, you know, there's lots of steps to, you could always um, increase the number of patches, move from a 10 by 10 grid to, you know, a 20 by 20. Um, but certain things start to get extreme when you're working in the Excel platform. So, um, you know, that's why we're excited that it's continuing to evolve and it's been passed off to EDF and, and they can work with it. Um, we've thought about if we had more time looking into the R Shiny platform and, um, and just some of the um, innovating towards uh, more complex platforms that have the potential to incorporate, um, yeah, more a larger grid size, maybe more complex equations when data is available to run the bioeconomic model, um, and that. So that's yeah, that's what would come to mind. The you know the limitations surrounding the platform itself, but that's what made it appropriate for the data port context to begin with. Awesome. So we've got one question left here. If anybody else has any questions, feel free to pop them in the questions panel there on the GoToWebinar control box. Um, and this, I think, is a great way to kind of summarize everything up here. Uh, so if you've had uh, one piece of advice to give people when they're using this tool for the first time to make sure that they're using it effectively, what would that be? This is Sarah. My, my advice would be to make sure that you're using it as a complement to other information that drives design decisions rather than using it as uh, you know, an, an end-all, be-all. It, it's really intended to be one additional piece of information that people may otherwise not have. And so it's important to consider the outputs in the context of other things that matter to people at the site. In some cases, a turf reserve design option may just not be practical. And so if a model says that it might be better for biological and economic outcomes, um, that's one deciding factor. But it's, it's important to um, you know, consider that in the context of, of what the community sees as viable uh, management options. Jen, what about you? Um, yeah, I would definitely second that, um, really understanding the tool's uh, purpose. Um, and then, I mean, I, <laughs> and this kind of puts it back on that potential user, but I would say, um, you know, if, if somebody's out there downloading it for use in a new context and, and comes across any challenges moving through the user guide or um, understanding, you know, what a certain prompt means or data that, um, you know, to, to provide, you know, feedback in terms of the procedural um, use of the tool because that will just help improve it in the end. Um, and, and um, yeah, I mean, hopefully the user guide is good at, at, to walk everybody through it. Um, the only other little technical detail from um, my experience would be just to make sure that uh, you enable your your macros when you're when you're running the um, the Excel tool. <laughs> yes, <laughs> macros are always <laughs> the important thing that you always forget to enable when you're doing an Excel worksheet like that. <laughs> you wonder why things aren't working. 
Uh, so we have one more question come in. Um, wondering how phishing organizations and associations and cooperatives can help uh, in a design process and management process for TERF. I, I think that it's, as we talked about in Fish Forever, the, the campaign managers are putting together stakeholder working groups to design the TERF reserves. And I think it's really essential for uh, Fisher organizations to have adequate representation in these design processes to encourage individual fishermen to participate and also to um, you know have their leaders serve as a voice for people who aren't present in those meetings and uh, Fisher organizations can really be powerful in that sense to make sure that the Fisher's priorities are are brought to the front of the design process. Awesome. Well, that is all the questions we have. So thank you guys so much for presenting this. And I am thrilled that this is such an easy tool to download. It's just Excel. Everybody knows how to do Excel. Just make sure you enable those macros and everything will go smoothly, I'm sure. Um, and as you all see, uh, Sarah's email is there on the screen. So feel free to reach out to her if you have any questions. Uh, we'll be archiving this webinar on openchannels.org slash webinars in about an hour and a half. So if you want to share it with your colleagues, feel free to do so. Uh, and make sure you visit fisheriesolutionscenter.edf.org uh, to find out more about the TERF design tool and download the user guide. Um, and with that, thank you.